I think it's interesting to follow the journey of the sun through the record. The sun makes at least three appearances. So in the opening track, one of the questions is, how will it feel when the sun can truly kiss me? So here we're yearning for a moment of a particular encounter with the sun. In Seasons, the second track, look at me, look at me now. The sun rises and sets somehow. Of course, this is a song about change, the changing seasons and mutability. By the end of that first verse, we have summer sun, winter snow. So not only do we have uh, the sun rising and setting in a cycle, a daily cycle, we also have, of course, the sun changing from season to season. So there are these multiple changes. And then by the end of the record, of course, the sun is in sunset vignette. Um, the sun sets and we rest. Do you have any reflections on the way in which this, these different cameos that the sun is making in these three different songs? I would say uh, the natural world plays is a central character in all of my writing. Is has been really since my band Sun Gods to Gamma Rays, <laughs> which cracks me up because of the name. I've always been very fascinated on the cosmos and the this planet that we live on and the the spinning of this rock and our place within all of the universe and. So the sun showing up, I think, is just um, very much a usual thing that happens in my writing. Um, it's, I think, part of my almost at this point uh, to contemplate time and how um, the physical motion of this planet plays into it. I studied a lot of kind of like paganism a number of years ago, five or six years ago, and really am, have been and continue to be interested in just how, you know, a lot of, of modern pagans kind of think about the, the cycle of time. And, and so I think the sun showing up is just a continuation of, of those ideas. The cycle of each day is, feels like a gift. And um, there is this thing that really happens to our body as the sun is setting that just triggers our, our bodily system to say like now we down regulate and go to bed and there's an intelligence to that to and to the guidance there the diurnal cycle now we down regulate there is such an intelligence to that which is not controlled by the rational mind, by, by the conscious mind. I'm glad we've been talking briefly about their novelist and philosophy, because the title of one of the songs, of course, is a song about stories and sleep, and we also just referenced sleep. What is the song, a song about stories and sleep, conveying about stories? A song about stories and sleep is a very literal um, kind of coming to terms with um, the fact that my last partner uh, passed away and and um, just thinking about how he would always tell these really wild stories that were very exuberant and he was just the funniest loudest person in the room so the story specifically really just relate to he was just a magnificent storyteller and was such a big personality. So yeah, the stories in that song just are very specific to that experience. And and the song is is deeply personal um, and based out of that experience. There's a celebration of storytelling and this these shared stories that the two of you would tell for years. And also even before then, these stories would make the crowds laugh. So uh, we spoke at the end of our previous interview about tea, um, when Holly Hansen's um, 
Tuesday early evening at 31 uh, club events and about um, one's community as um, almost like a congregation um, and it just it struck me that again in this interview we've been recognizing how storytelling in this song and and music there's a magic to them for want of a better word there's something which has not been mm -hmm. fully understood and honored about the way in which we form stories and honor and celebrate stories and uh, and what music is for us I was going to reflect on on what you were saying about stories um, and how it relates to kind of performing and and that song specifically you know the person it's about he was a musician as well and um, there was something about kind of performing for a crowd that was extremely memorable about about his performances specifically and and making making like just do it again it's like doing that primal thing but you're like in front of all these people and you're creating a space and a community to do that stuff together whether it's laughing or grieving or whatever and it's coming out through the song but every t i think every time a musician if a, if a musician chooses to we have the opportunity to create these communal spaces that almost feel congregational um where we express you know the person who's sharing is expressing this like deep humanity in a room full of people who are there to witness it and are there to recognize it and and so it kind of you know taps into that primal piece about the broader storytelling which is really just an innately human experience whether that storytelling is happening through um, some sort of theatrical performance or it's through a song or it's through comedy it's it's just very it's just very human and um, it's very enriching I think absolutely uh, the another shout out to Holly um, in the in the CD sleeve or in the credits uh, to the pre to to dream life there was the statement peace and love and self-awareness and in our previous interview you were highlighting that those were your, your three top ideals but then later on in the interview we added critical thought and the reason why it seemed promising to um to close our interview with a um, turn to the book non-violent communication is i think this is going to enable us to really grapple with something which you've been focusing on since before that previous interview too, to quote you before, um, the balance between logic and emotionality. So in Deepak Chopra's forward to nonviolent communication just here, there is a celebration of uh, the way in which Marshall Rosenberg is recognizing kind of the negative role um, that that stories play. All stories lead to conflict, says Deepak Chopra in the yeah. introduction. Personal reality always contains a story and the story we live beginning from infancy is based on language. So again, this is recognized as a problem. You know, uh, I could, if I'm, if I don't have enough self-awareness to recognize this you know then it can just be the simon show and you know similarly to to what you were saying before we if we don't kind of if we just get lost in the emotionality and the model of nonviolent communication begins with this skepticism about these stories that we form for me there's one moment in the forward where there's a reference to music uh, which seems very significant. I'm going to quote that and I'm just perhaps as a precursor to a longer conversation we could have on another occasion. Um, I'm really interested in your reflection on, on this. So Deepak Chopra again is focusing on 
these moments of ahimsa. In India, there's an ancient model for nonviolent living known as ahimsa, which is central to the nonviolent life. And these moments of ahimsa occur in meditation or self selfless awareness is the state we're in when nature or art or music creates a sense of wonder. The only difference between those moments to which we can add all experiences of creativity, love and play and ahimsa is that they flicker in and out while ahimsa is a settled state. It reveals that stories and the egos that fuel them are illusions, self-created models for survival and selfishness. It says the, the payoff for ahimsa is that you upgrade the illusion which is what the ego is always striving to do with more money, possessions, and power. The payoff is that you get to be who you really are. So we began by thinking about choosing a particular kind of way of being human, the full human package. And here in the forward to nonviolent communication, we're being presented with a, a model, the, the model of nonviolent communication, which, and there's an analogy here with music, and the state of peace or equilibrium is like what we experience in music, but with the difference that it's settled. And for me, I feel that what's, what we're experiencing and celebrating in your magical, powerful, beautiful, vulnerable record is a different package with a different payoff. It's not at odds with the philosophy of nonviolent communication, but there's a celebration of story. There's a celebration of aspects of music that we could, if we want this particular payoff, that we might be too quick to move beyond. What are your thoughts on that? I think that we're living in a time where we can choose to understand the dynamic nature of expression and communication and that we can hold multiple truths um, that may be uh, seemingly at odds, but we can hold them at the same time. I just think it's, it's important to, to do the both and because mm. I'm not sure what the point is otherwise. Um, if if we're all trying to achieve this perfect stasis of of everybody being assimilated to the same ideology, that just sounds really boring to me. And it sounds very um, it's a it's a it's almost like a dominant mindset idea of how humanity should be. When the reality is, is we are all such specifically designed and built different animals and we all have our own creative emotional reactions to things so if we can create space to understand that other people might be out in the world in a way that's different than our way of being in the world it doesn't mean it's bad or wrong it's just different and we can we can have grace and mercy to hear each other and validate each other and so in some ways i feel like the nonviolent communication um quote is is saying is saying those things aren't valuable and I just I would maybe say like I'd call their bluff and yeah. say like we we need the diversity of thought we need the diversity of emotional response we need people who are choosing to be very uh, very measured in their way of being in the world and we need people who are choosing to be very unmeasured in the way in their way of being in the world we need the full spectrum in between and nothing about that feels violent to me. It just feels like people, like human people in the world. And it's our job to just um, hear each other and, and see the humanness in each other and validate and ask questions. And, and, and hopefully we can all just kind of be like softening ourselves over time because we're because we're learning from one another. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, <laughs> and I hope, I think it's working for me, but I just, uh, yeah. I'm definitely with you. Nonviolent communication is all about 
listening, seeing, seeing one another. So there is this endeavor to, you know, to not impose the story, to ensure that we do see one another and allow that which is, which longs to be expressed, to allow it to be emerged. There are two in the closing sentence, in the closing pages, there are two references to songs. Marshall Rosenberg ends up writing songs and um, to celebrate the achievement of these more peaceful encounters. And for me, I think even the book itself is kind of reaching beyond its stated philosophy as the theorician <laughs> resorts to songwriting which has a different payoff so it's just so much to um so much to to dive deeper into there <laughs>